Hi, everybody. I'm Sunny, and this is We Gotta Talk, a live weekly digital talk show and podcast where we like to dig deep. Real talk, big topics. Now, let's dig in. Hey everybody, welcome to We Gotta Talk. We are in the middle of a series on the Dobbs ruling here on the podcast. And we've been trying to provide you with both an informational um, sort of point of view and some perspectives that talk about the implication of this ruling, what it means as we go forward and what it means as we look back where we've come from. And today's guest is here to provide some very critical input. We have Dr. Philip Munoz. He is the Tocqueville Associate Professor of Political Science and concurrent Associate Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame. He's the founding director of their Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. There is no better person to explain the constitutional implications and causes of this ruling than Dr. Philip Munoz. I'm so grateful for your being here. We have a bit of a personal connection as well through my husband. So thank you for letting me steal a few minutes of your time. My pleasure. So we are here talking about pretty much how we got here. Uh, Philip, I want to know... Um, on the most basic 101 level, people who aren't overly familiar with constitutional law, can you provide an overview of this ruling and the court's reversal of Roe v. Wade? Sure, sure. Um, uh, let me preface like how it, how it happened. I guess mm -hmm. is what I'm asking. Let me, yeah. let me preface my answer by saying, uh, in, usually it takes me three weeks to answer the question you just asked. <laughs> so, uh, three weeks of class time. Um, uh, we should go back to a case called Griswold versus Connecticut which is in the early 60s, uh, 61 or 63, I just can't remember, but in the 60s. Uh, in, in that case, um, it involved a Connecticut law, a 19th century Connecticut law that banned um, contraception. Um, I don't even remember the date of the law. Now, the law wasn't really enforced, but um, it was challenged in court. And it got all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, in a case called Griswold versus Connecticut, again, 60s case, ruled that the law was unconstitutional because it violated the right to privacy. Um, it was not a particularly controversial uh, decision insofar as um, this law wasn't really being enforced in the first place. Um, you know, people weren't getting arrested for having contraception or anything like that. Um, it'd be interesting actually to go back and read the newspapers and see if it made the New York Times and Washington Post. I, I don't know the answer to the question. Um, uh, for our purposes, it got the idea of a right to privacy, a constitutional right to privacy uh, on the books. In the Griswold case, it was a right to marital privacy, privacy inher inhered in the relationship of, of the marriage, of, of traditional marriage at the time. Um, so there was a right to marital privacy found uh, in the Constitution. Now, where exactly that right um, resides was a little bit ambiguous. Uh, the Constitution doesn't use the word privacy. Um, there is um, clearly privacy is implicated uh, in all sorts of places. Um, uh, First Amendment protects religious freedom. And so your religious opinions are a sort of type of privacy. It's not not the government's business, uh, what your religious beliefs are and can't be uh, thrown in jail for worshiping a certain way or failing to worship a certain way. So that's the type of privacy. Uh, um, uh, your right uh, against unreasonable searches and seizures, with it, which is the Fourth Amendment. That's also implicates the right to privacy. Um, and the Fourteenth Amendment protects against uh, the uh, 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 abridgments of liberty without due process of law. And the, the court said, look, all this um, in some combination, in some way, and the Ninth Amendment as well, uh, protects a right to privacy, again, of marital privacy, which allows a married couple to procure uh, birth control. That's in the 60s. Uh, in a separate uh, ruling, and I think this is 1972, the right to marital privacy becomes a right to in uh, individual privacy. And now women have the right to procure, constitutional right to procure abortion. Um, those two cases are on the books when Roe versus Wade is uh, heard and adjudicated. And so the, the court in Roe cites precedent saying we've recognized a right to privacy wherever that right is and whatever it encompasses, it certainly encompasses a right to, uh, for women to procure an abortion, at least at some points in her pregnancy. Um, and that's the trimester framework. So um, basically an unlimited right in the first trimester, um, more limited in the second trimester, and then states could 
and a row uh, limit abortion in the third trimester, again, speaking broadly. Now there's a companion case that's often overlooked here called Doe versus Bolton, I believe, decided, I think on the very same day as Roe, or I'm, I'm almost certain that's true, if not the same day, then um, uh, certainly the same year. And in Doe, the court said, um, uh, a woman's constitutional right to uh, an abortion uh, covers all cases where the abortion is needed uh, uh, in cases of uh, life, the life and health of the mother. Now, the life of the mother uh, is usually understood to be when the, her life is endangered because of the pregnancy. You know, that happens sometimes. Her health includes psychological health. So if, um, uh, in the view of medical experts, including psychological experts, a woman's psychological health would be impaired on account of being pregnant, um, she basically had an unlimited right to procure an abortion. Uh, Doe is sort of the exception that uh, ate the trimester um, framework of Roe. So really, you, if you take Doe and Roe together in 1973, you had pretty much a, a right to an abortion um, if you met certain conditions all the way through pregnancy. So my, my follow-up question is someone who is obviously not a, a constitutional law expert, but is hearing this explanation you're giving is people are asking, why doesn't the right to choose fall under the right to privacy if marital rights are protected under that and other precedents are upheld regarding contraception or even I know you didn't bring this up this would be a separate case or gay marriage what made abortion be different than the rest of those that are somehow upheld in precedent yeah so uh, well so in 1973 the court said it abortion did fall under the right to privacy and they reaffirmed mm -hmm. that um, decision um, numerous times, including uh, most importantly in the 1992 case, uh, Casey, um, which is a, came uh, from Pennsylvania. Um, and there, they, the, the, the Casey displaced Roe as a precedent because it gave a new standard. Um, the standard in Casey is that uh, states couldn't put an undue burden on a woman's fundamental right to procure an abortion. Um, uh, and it put the line of viability. Mm -hmm. uh, so it added, uh, and they got rid of the trimesters and said there's a right to an abortion um, uh, before viability, and states can't impose an undue burden uh, on that right. But the important point was the right to an abortion was recognized again mm -hmm. under the general right to privacy. Now, both the dissenters in, in Roe and the dissenters in Casey, in a way, the dissent is easier to understand. They simply said... Um, Justice Black and Roe said, look, I like my privacy as much as the next guy, but it's not in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't say there's a right to privacy. Um, and we are not, we Supreme Court justices are not in the business of making up rights. Um, if, it doesn't mean that a legal right to an abortion could not be uh, legislated, but it's the job of the legislature to, to safeguard mm -hmm. such a right. And it's subject to ordinary politics. And, and uh, so it would be a civil right, not a constitutional right. Uh, the Constitution doesn't protect all things we might want. It, it, there's a number of limited rights uh, that were placed in the Constitution. And again, this is Justice Black. Okay? Uh, and our job is to enforce the Constitution. Uh, the right to privacy is not in there. So tell us in plain... As, as plain as you can, because I know this will vary state by state, what the Dobbs ruling did exactly. There is a concern among among certain people that this immediately and irrevocably takes back all rights to abortion. That's obviously not the case. I, we don't want to deal in broad brushstrokes here. We want to deal in nuance. So for anyone who is wondering what this really means, who's just watching media might think, okay, there are, there are no rights left. That is not the case. Explain what precisely the Dobbs ruling has done. Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that question. It's a, it's a, exactly the right one. Um, uh, many people have the misunderstanding that if, if the court overturns Roe, or now that the court has overturned Roe and Casey, then abortion is illegal. That's not correct. Uh, what it means is that you don't have a constant, a woman doesn't have a constitutional right to procure an abortion. Um, it means that the question of abortion, for the most part, goes back to state governments. And states are free to do, uh, regulate abortion or or not as they see fit. So in blue states, California, for example, um, abortion on demand will be available throughout pregnancy. 
um, effectively, if you're in a in California or I'm from Seattle, so Washington or a blue state, your um, right to procure an abortion probably has not changed at all. Or if anything in response to Dobbs, those states have liberalized. Now, if you're in a red state, then, then your um, your rights have changed probably. Um, uh, so I'm in Indiana and. Um, We'll see what Indiana law legislates, but in some states already, um, there's a few states that had trigger laws. As soon as Roe and Casey were overturned, abortion became severely restricted or even illegal. Um, so it's up to our state governments. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of talk right now about what the national government should do, and a lot of Democrats want Joe Biden to do something. Um, it's not so clear to me that um, Congress or the president can do anything constitutionally. What's most clear, um, and I think no one disputes this, is that the question really is a, primarily a state question now, meaning our state mm -hmm. government. So a state can make abortion illegal. Uh, a state can safeguard and say you have a civil right as a citizen of the state of California or Florida or wherever you are to procure an abortion for nine months before viability. It's, states can are free to legislate as they see fit, subject to their own constitutions. Right? Every state has a constitution, and if uh, your state protects the right to privacy or is it interpreted to protect the right to privacy that covers an abortion, you might have a state constitutional right. I've, I've heard some other experts weigh in on this and say that the Dobbs ruling is atypical in the sense that practically speaking, i.e. when the rubber hits the road, this essentially has the effect of removing rights from women, even if it's only in certain states. Has there been any other um, ruling by the Supreme Court that has the has had the same sort of practical impact? And do you agree with that assessment that even though the Supreme Court is saying, OK, look, we're just um, we're just looking at the Constitution and we're saying what it does give us the right to decide and what it doesn't give us the right to decide at the federal level. And we're just kind of saying that. Um, do you agree with that argument or do you disagree and why or why not? Well, I mean, really, you can't. The fundamental, fundamental question is, is there a right to procure an abortion in the Constitution? If you think there is such a right, then uh, you think Roe is right and Casey was right and Dobbs is wrong and that you've lost mm -hmm. it. If you think, no, there was never a right in the Constitution, then you say, no, there was there was never a right in the Constitution. The court made up a right um, in 1972, and it reaffirmed that made up right in 1979, sorry, 1973 and then 1992. But there never was that right in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, in a way, you can't avoid the question, um, does the Constitution actually protect a uh, right to an abortion? And I, I think this is the way I tell my students. I mean, people would disagree. Um, what we want the Constitution to say is different than what it does say, right? Um, and I think it's too easy for all of us to say, well, this, these uh, bundle of things, A, B, and C, are really important to me. Therefore, it must be in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, we're a democratic republic. Actually, most things are not in the Constitution, and they're protected or not based on democratic votes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's interesting. Of course, that does that argument. You're right. It, it kind of serves both sides, because if the Supreme Court doesn't decide what you like, all of a sudden it's an archaic and outdated sort of institution, a way to look at things. And if they do, it's like, oh, look how look how great we are. Yeah, it really does depend on your perspective. Absolutely. Why? Why? Um, tell us about how certain precedents are upheld and how how some aren't. I think as uh, an out, sorry, personally sorry, outside of this. Can yeah, I go yeah, back? For you, sure. you, asked the, you asked two questions before, and I only answered one of them. Oh, Your second yeah. question was about, um, has this been done before? And um, yeah, certainly uh, precedents have been overturned. So um, all sorts of property rights that people um, thought they had, um, the right to contract, famously, the Supreme Court recognized in a case, um, uh, a famous case called Lochner. Um, he, here, um, uh, the, the idea of freedom of contract was that if um, I want to work and you want to hire me, I have a right to contract. And so in this case, it was a New York law that limited the hours of, of uh, that a baker could work in a bakery. I think it was 60 hours a week or something like that. And this guy said, look, I'm a baker and I want to work more than 60 hours a week. And this guy owns a bakery and he wants to pay me to work more than 60 hours a week. Um, and the Supreme Court said, yes, you had that right. 
Um, now, that may or may not be in the Constitution. In one case, the Supreme Court says it was. And then in a subsequent case, they overturned Lochner and said, no, there's no um, category right to contract and your uh, labor can be regulated by the state. Now, if you believed in the right to contract, you feel like your right was lost. Um, the opponent said, no, that right was never in the Constitution. Um, so this doesn't happen all the time, but it's not, it's not altogether infrequent uh, mm -hmm. as, as well. A lot of constitutional scholars, even those who are pro-choice, have argued that Roe was kind of a, a mess from a constitutional perspective to begin with. And I feel like I've, I'm hearing you sort of allude to that as well, that it was a hanging by, by a thread, even from a constitutional perspective when it was originally passed. Can you provide your thoughts on that regard? Yeah, I think no one, um, I don't want to overstate the case, but no serious legal scholar thought Roe, the Roe opinion was a, a elegant judicial or persuasive judicial opinion. I mean, it reads like legislation, which might be perfectly commonsensical leg legislation, but the court's not supposed to legislate. Um, now, lots of people who defend the idea of a right to privacy that covers abortion said there were better ways that um, abortion could have been protected. Um, but that, that did make Roe particularly vulnerable um, just because it really was so badly and loosely uh, reasoned. Um, you can even see that in Casey itself, which up, uphold, up, upheld Roe. I mean, they basically replaced Roe implicitly saying, you know, the, the, the legal logic of Roe was not very persuasive. Here's a different standard. Now, what Justice Alito wrote in Dobbs was said, look, Roe wasn't persuasive and Casey was no more legally persuasive. Um, and, um, you know, there's something to be said for that, even if you uh, are ardently pro-choice. Um, uh, the, the right to privacy is not even in the Constitution and the right to abortion clearly, I mean, it's clearly not spelled out explicitly in the Constitution. You have to make some um, inferences and that makes the right weaker. It's not like free speech or freedom of religion or search and seizure, which clearly are in the Constitution. Again, I'm not so saying that- Broader concepts. Yeah, and all this means again to say is if there's not an individual right in the Constitution, it means that we as a, people, in this case, in our state governments, deliberate, should we protect abortion or not? These are the circumstances where it can be allowed. This is how we'll fund it as through our government, or this is why we'll ban it. And it's up, right. to, it's up to the people acting through the democratic political process to answer those questions. Is there a world you envision, um, Dr. Munoz, in, in which not only does, does Congress act to legislate on this, perhaps making this a, a, a nationally recognized right, you know, legally speaking. And, and beyond that, is there a world in which the pro-choice contingent of this argument may even come to see this ruling as having been a, a sort of necessary hurdle to getting to where they want to go? Because what I'm hearing you say is it was flim Roe was flimsy from the beginning. So if you really want it, maybe this is the best way to do it. Is there a world where you see either or both of those happening? Well, let me skip, let me answer the question more hypothetically and then sort of in our actual politics today. I mean, hypothetically, the way if you wanted a national right to an abortion, the clearest and soundest way to do that would be to pass a constitutional amendment that adds a right to an abortion. Right. Uh, then it would be clear. Now, it's very, very hard to pass a constitutional amendment. I don't see that happening uh, anytime soon. But that would be um, the way you update or modify or change the Constitution is you amend it. There's an amendment mm -hmm. process, and that certainly could be done if the American people in sufficient numbers wanted that to be done. Um, so that's, in a way, the clearest and most obvious way to protect a right to abortion. It's also probably the least likely. And then there's national legislation. Um, uh, Congress, our federal Congress, can't simply legislate on whatever it wants to legislate on. It ha it's uh, Congress has limited legislative powers and it can legislate on certain subjects. Those are listed in the constitution. Um, and it's not clear that there's a constitutional constitutional authority, that Congress has constitutional authority to legislate on the matter of abortion. Um, some people think it can based on what's called the commerce clause. Uh, Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, in simplest terms, it means um, 
uh, the states can't put up trade barriers, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you want, uh, you know, you're shipping whatever product you make, um, you know, from Florida to, Pit uh, to Pennsylvania, um, Pennsylvania can't put a tariff, mm -hmm. on, right? Congress is, regulates interstate uh, commerce. Um, now, is abortion a matter of interstate commerce? Well, m most abortions are not. I mean, traveling, you know, Congress can pass a law saying you can travel, you have a right to travel to procure, procure an abortion. But most abortions happen, you know, in a medical facility or some sort of facility, and there's no interstate commerce really involved. Um, it's not implausible that Congress could pass legislation under its interstate commerce clause. Whether that would be upheld by the Supreme Court um, is, is doubtful to me. I think the Supreme Court would probably strike that down. Interesting. There's so, only so, one way to find out. You know, in, in, in a few years, we probably will find out if Congress acts. Um, it, I'm sorry, you, you finished. I, I just wanted to go back on one other question I have before we move on. I know you're at, well, well I, I, you know, and again, this is a layman's perspective here. Um, from what I understand, there are different ways and each Supreme Court justice sort of um, approaches the interpretation of the Constitution differently, right? You have the, I, I don't know what the exact terms are, but one, you kind of stick to the text and two, it's more interpretive. It's, it's interpreted to the modern world. I think yeah. my question and a lot of people's questions sort of from our perspective is if we see the Supreme Court evolving and moving with the times in regards to contraception, in regards to gay marriage, and putting things in place that allow people to have the freedom to make those decisions, I, I'm, I'm still struggling to understand the point of differentiation between the abortion issue, i.e. the women's health issue, versus those. Because it does seem that the Supreme Court has recognized and chooses to recognize, I, I don't want to call them constructs because they've always existed, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it has, has evolved to recognize rights um, that, you know, weren't there, uh, legally speaking, back in the, you know, the 1700s. So what is the difference there? Can you explain that to me? Yeah. Okay. So let me, there's several things going on there. L uh, let me um, try to answer um, the main threads of your question. So on the question of uh, well, if the court can overturn the precedents that protected abortion, why can't it overturn precedents on gay marriage or contraception or these other things, which are also connected to the same constitutional source, which is the 14th Amendment due process clause. And if there's no due process right for an abortion, why is there a due process right for um, gay marriage, for example? And, and I think you're onto something. I think, um, and Justice Thomas said, it's, said so as much. Now, um, I'm not all the conservatives on the court agreed with him, but if um, rights that were, um, let's say found by the Supreme Court or created by the Supreme Court uh, can be unfound or uncreated by the Supreme Court. I mean, that's the basic logic of your question. And I think that's true. Mm -hmm. Now, um, is there, are there five votes to overturn gay marriage or the uh, privacy protections for contraception? I think the answer is clearly no. So realistically, that's not going to happen. Yeah, you know, and I'm not trying to imply that they should be. It's just a, it's just a yeah, question yeah. that follows, right? It just seems like, you know, the constitution evolves where it wants to evolve in another place. You know, it's, it's an unpredictable, the Supreme yeah. Court is an unpredictable beast when taken in totality. And I guess that's a great follow-up question too, which is how do these justices, um, you know, who pride themselves on approaching things and, you know, at least in an outward way, they say in a nonpartisan way, how can we trust as citizens that the way that they're interpreting the constitution represents not just their pol political and personal beliefs, but also the plurality of the American people? Well, I don't know that we can. We can uh, trust them uh, either side uh, to, to not legislate on what they think is right. Um, now, part of the issue here is when we talk about an evolving constitution, right? The, uh, we need to keep the constitution um, current with the times. Um, in Hughes' view, and necessarily that means, well, in the view of the Supreme Court, um, uh, William Brennan, yeah, maybe the most um, influential and important uh, uh, liberal justice of the second half of the 20th century, he said, um, and he was a great proponent of the idea of an evolving constitution, and he said, look, uh, Supreme Court justices should read the constitution to protect human dignity, and therefore those parts of the constitution, those 18th century parts that don't protect human dignity, 
the death penalty was an example. He said, look, the death penalty, the founders thought the death penalty was constitutional, but he said, we now know that the death penalty is, uh, should, is against dignity and therefore should be unconstitutional. And so he wanted this moral or evolving reading of the constitution to keep the constitution current. And this is basically uh, progressive jurisprudence even today um, follows this line of thought. Um, well, what would, imagine a conservative employing the progressive method of jurisprudence. So what does human dignity require regarding abortion? Well, a conservative would say, a pro-life conservative might say, well, obviously we understand that uh, uh, all human beings are equal and the unborn are human beings. And therefore human dignity, a progressive approach to the constitution, a moral approach to the constitution requires Roe to be overturned. It's interesting. Yeah. There's I'm, nothing, I'm, I'm, there's nothing yeah. in the progressive method that guarantees progressive results. Yeah, that is really, that's fascinating and interesting. And what I'm hearing as we talk is that, uh, you know, we, we so often look at this issue as a victory for one side and a loss for the other. But when you shift your perspective, you can immediately see how one decision you might immediately deem negative or you know, um, damaging for your side could be immediately flipped with just the tiniest shift of perspective. It's so that what you just said is something I, I really wouldn't have considered. I do wonder though. Let me even push it, Penny. Let me yeah, push it even further to really draw the implications. So um, if you think, no, the, the role of the Supreme Court judge is to evolve the constitution in light of morality and human dignity. And you have justices on the Supreme Court, a majority that says, Yes, I agree with that. We should protect human dignity and morality. And human dignity and morality advocate the sanctity of all life. There's nothing in that method that would stop those justices for saying the unborn have a right to life. It's actually the progressive method that could lead to abortion becoming illegal as a constitutional right. Wow. And I don't think I people have thought, thought of that. Yeah, yeah. But there's nothing in the method that prevents that. Right. Uh, for this reason, I think many people uh, would be wise to say, well, maybe the role of the Supreme Court is only to actually interpret those rights that are there. Um, so this brings me to another point, which I think is important. Um, we need to think about who decides these questions. You know, who ought to be deciding the question of abortion? And there are two main choices or three, you know, look, we can decide as a people through our national legislature, we can decide as a people through our state governments, or we can let a majority of nine completely unelected, uh, unrepresentative folks who mostly went to elite law schools decide. Hmm. The democratic decision is actually to let people decide in the, at the state level. I mean, uh, Dobbs, I mean, lots of people, lots of my friends don't like Dobbs. It's a, it's a decision in favor of democracy, right? Roe was anti-democratic. It took power away from the people to govern themselves. Now, we may or may not like the results of that, but it was anti-democratic for sure. So we reviewed this a little while back, but just to put a bow on it, for there to be legally protected rights to abortion, to pro-choice options. Let's say that because I think the pro-choice movement sometimes gets unfairly cast as pro-abortion. So what what is the likelihood, in your opinion, that there will be any movement? And you outlined these two ways that this could happen, the amendment or the other option just about five or 10 minutes back. But now let's focus on the likelihood of either one of those yeah. happening, because I think the contingent, the pro-choice contingent wants to understand, OK, so you're telling me there's work to be done. But what where, what what do we even do? Because it seems like a big mountain to climb. Well, the main battle will be in states. And I, most blue, if you're in a blue state, you probably don't have much to fear about if you, if you um, believe in a constitution or I'm sorry, a legal right to abortion. Um, the, on the legal front, there'll be a lot of state constitutional um, fights, I think, you know, mm -hmm. does, the, does the California constitution or does the Florida constitution or the Indiana constitution, do they protect the right to abortion? So we'll have... Um, mm -hmm. The same thing that was happening at the Supreme Court will likely happen at a lot, a lot of state Supreme Courts. Um, and state constitutions are different. And, you know, every state has its own sort of constitutional jurisprudence. And um, so most of the legal battles, I think, will happen at the state. 
Now, those won't get the most attention, but in a way, those are the most important. And then it's the state legislatures. It really, I mean, state politics are a lot more important mm -hmm. uh, now than they were a couple months ago. Um, yeah, you're right. It seems like the individuals are being tasked with more responsibility now. If you didn't participate in elections before and you questioned the relevance of voting for your state legislators, I mean, this is for whatever either side you 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 fall on here. This is um, a clear call to action that people need to be involved in, in government and in a way it puts the onus back on us as citizens to kind of, you know, take our role back. Um, yeah. And, and so I I'm a sort of partisan of democracy. Um, um, and I think in general, not obviously in all cases, in general, it's better for the people to be able to make the laws that they live under. Mm -hmm. um, so in some sense, I think um, uh, from a democratic perspective, um, not not um, democratic capital D, but just a democrat. I mean, right. the people can vote on the laws that they live under. Um, this is a healthy development. But then it's now it's up to the people, mm -hmm. again, primarily in every state to decide. And um, Look, we're a large country, and we we really disagree with each other on this matter and others. Um, probably the best way to get along is to let people um, pass laws that they they want, and then people can move with their feet. That's one of the advantages of a federal system. I mean, how do you get a how do you get a large country that morally disagrees um, to be one country? And the way part of the genius of the American system is federalism. And that's, look, we don't have to agree on everything. You know, we have different states and we can have different laws and law doesn't have to be the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. We might not like it um, if you live in a state you don't want to live, but what's the alternative? We impose our moral view on everyone else. Um, you know, and I have strong views on this, um, but I, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather see the country agree to disagree and keep things on a local level than um, bludgeon one one side bludgeon the other at the national level. That's my sort of democratic partisanship. Yeah, I mean, this is this is wonderful perspective. I want to. I know you're running short on time, so if we could just wrap up with two sure. or three very quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, I asked this of another expert. We had an expert on last week who was a women's public policy expert. She talked about the practicalities of this ruling, how it might look as people as women receive health care from the OBGYNs, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked her this question, and I'm curious for your perspective as well. Surveys have shown that most Americans agree on what reasonable restrictions on abortion should be. And they probably look similar to a lot of other modern and developed countries, mm -hmm. restricting access to abortion between a certain or beyond a certain point in pregnancy, making exceptions in extremely rare cases where women's health or mental health is threatened. Um, if that still seems to be the sentiment of the American public, well, how has every other country caught up in a way to legally represent its people. And we haven't done that. And you just walked us through, we don't have to go back through the sort of like the legal way to get there again, but just from a holistic point of view, I just want to know your thoughts on how we haven't landed yet specifically where we can reflect what most people seem to think about this issue. Yeah, no, no. Well, it's because we as a people haven't been able to vote on it, really. It's been decided by the Supreme Court. And yeah. before Dobbs, American abortion law was much more permissive than uh, almost every other nation in the world, you know, except for North Korea and a few other states. Mm -hmm. You know, abortion, re abortion is much more restricted in Europe and most of the developed world than it was under Roe. Right. And, and I think there was like a 12 or 16 weeks. I can't remember what most of the EU is. Yeah, it varies from state to state. But yeah, you know, and, and you know, we were at viability, which was much later um, before Dobbs. And, right. Um, so I think in lots of states, we're actually going to get sort of a middle ground where um, abortion is available or earlier in the pregnancy. And that will be, you know, some states abortion is going to be basically illegal, except um, in the cases of the life of the mother. In mm -hmm. other states, um, it will be available um, early in pregnancies. And in some states, it will be available throughout pregnancy. Uh, in some states, there'll be no public funding. And some states, there'll be lots of public funding. Um, mm -hmm. And it will just reflect our state politics. And what will be interesting is to see how views of um, the voting public change over the next five to 10 years now that they can actually vote on this subject. Right. 
Right. That's so interesting. Um, Gosh, you know, you know, this does t talking to someone who's an expert in the policy and like the the legalities behind it really changes your perspective. I, I would guess no matter what side you fall on. If you're on one side, it outlines the work to be done. If you're on the other side, it outlines the importance of the things that you've been striving to uphold. So it's really interesting to get your perspective on this because it shows what a complicated issue it is beyond the morality issue and beyond the immediate visceral reaction that we all of us so often have to this issue. Yeah, I, I would say, um, let, let me try to take the perspective of both the pro-life and pro-choice sides for just a second. For, for the pro-choice side, um, if um, obviously uh, Dobbs feels like a huge loss, that's totally understandable. Um, on the other hand, if the American people really are in support of uh, the right to procure an abortion, then that will be reflected in law, not everywhere, but... Um, um, better for laws to be passed democratically than imposed on the Supreme Court. And if the American people really are pro-choice people, which uh, pro-choicers pro uh, say, then that will be reflected in law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for the pro-life side, um, this is their opportunity to say, um, why are they pro-life, right? And to try to convince American people that um, all life, including pre-born life is uh, and sacred and should be respected. And I think um, because people haven't had to really vote on this subject, um, in a way, it's, uh, I think a lot of people don't really know what they think. Mm. Uh, and now it's, you know, and now it's an opportunity for both sides to present their views and uh, try to convince their fellow citizens. Um, mm. And hopefully that will be done uh, civilly and respectfully and um, we'll have legislation that um, not only reflects uh, the will of the people, but, um, you know, that's morally good. Wonderful. Two rapid fire questions. You can blow through these, but I can't not ask them. Um, you are, are working and, and teaching at Notre Dame. It is widely considered to be a, a, a conservative institution, mm -hmm. but it, it is also getting the reputation these days of being a little less conservative than it used to be. If you could take the temperature of the student population in the midst of this ruling, and if I could also point everybody's attention, which I will link in show notes to a great debate you sent me, Philip, which um, was argued as part of uh, one of your legal programs there. Um, what is it like? What are people saying on campus? And um, what are they doing with that? What's, what's the vibe? Is there a lot of tension? Yeah, well, right now it's, uh, you know, everyone's on summer break, so no, no one's around right now. Um, I think, you know, the, the, you have to distinguish between the students and the faculty. The faculty um, are not conservative. It's a more liberal faculty than, um, than um, yeah, a, a strong majority are liberal on the faculty. The students are much more balanced. Um, um, I think the last, there was a survey um, the last time, uh, in Obama's reelection, and a slight majority of Notre Dame students, I believe, would have voted for Obama or favored Obama. Um, so the students are, you have the full range of opinions, which I actually mm -hmm. think is great. It, it's a vibrant intellectual place because there's lots of disagreement. Um, now on abortion, students tend to be more pro-life because there are a lot of Catholics. So um, uh, students who might be uh, more liberal um, are often liberal because they want government to protect the most vulnerable um, mm -hmm. and they understand the most vulnerable to be the unborn. So uh, this is one area where liberal and conservative students um, tend to align on abortion. So uh, the I would guess that um, uh, Notre Dame students are some, I don't know, 65% pro-life, but, you know, there's lots of students who are pro-choice and there's good vigorous debate on it. Yeah, yeah we love um, good debate. Yeah, we so love we good debate, debate, yes. which I uh, invite all your uh, uh, subscribers to watch. Um, it was really wonderful, I thought. Um, we had a woman named Zanda Sanctus. She's a pro life, really the pro life uh, voice of her generation. She's in her 20s. And then uh, Jill uh, Filipovic, who's a um, uh, very articulate pro choice um, def uh, abortion defender and a pro choice uh, perspective. And we did a Lincoln Douglas style debate. So each lady spoke for about 25 minutes. And, um, you know, there's, there, they could present um, their arguments however they wanted. I, I uh, just introduced them and then we let them make their case. And I thought both women did a phenomenally good job and they really engaged uh, one another. And then we had uh, about a half hour student questions. And so you can watch that debate that happened a few months ago at constudies.nd.edu.
We will link that as well. It was fantastic. And here on the show, we got to talk. We're all about um, uncomfortable conversations and sort of meeting in the middle, because I tend to agree with you that the more discussion we have about these things, the better, and that we only sort of come to resolutions that solve and, and most problems by by hearing perspectives, even that make us uncomfortable. So, um, okay, I, I could keep talking to you. I, I, I did want to ask Amy Coney Barrett, Justice Barrett was a colleague at Notre Dame for a while. Has she, have you ever talked to her about her thoughts on this or do they not, do, like when people become justices, do they just like not interact with the common folk anymore? <laughs> no, well, I, I do know Amy. I actually know her because uh, it's funny, uh, in my world, she's just the mom of my students. So, you know, she's crazy. Just the mom. Yeah, um, she's, you know, she's an amazing woman. Um, we, uh, we have not talked privately uh, uh, about abortion. Um, you know, she clerked for Justice Scalia. Um, it was pretty obvious where she stood on these things, not because of her personal opinions, but her judicial philosophy is one of following the text of the Constitution. Uh, and um, if the text is not clear, following the meaning of those who legislated the text. So if there's no right to privacy or explicit right to abortion, following Justice Scalia, following Justice Black, it's just not there. And so it was pretty clear that um, um, I think everyone knew that she would vote against, um, she would vote in favor of overturning Roe, uh, not necessarily because she herself is pro-life, but just because of her judicial philosophy. Now that said, I know she also is pro-life, so I, I, you know, but mm -hmm. you can, um, one can be, um, understand oneself to be faithful to the constitution and, and one should, if one's faithful to the Constitution, reach results that you disagree with politically. But what the Constitution says and the rights it protects are different from what we might want often. Right, right. Um, Dr. Philip Munoz, you have been so gracious to extend this much of your time to me today. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, we always ask people at the end of the show where we can find you to get in touch. Is there any social handle you want to share? Um, I know you probably don't have time to engage in meaningful debate outside of your actual classroom, but if someone were to reach out, what's the best social media way to get in touch? It's, it's, it's uh, easy to find me on the Notre Dame. Uh, just go to the Notre Dame political science website. You can find my information there. I'm at uh, Twitter though. I not really on Twitter much at, at the Philip Munoz with uh, two L's. Um, um, but because I want my kids not to be on social media, I try not to be on social media. Yeah, by so. example. Yeah. Well, in that case, my kids yeah. are. So, okay. <laughs> um, Dr. Philip Munoz, thank you again for spending some time with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for listening to this latest episode of We Gotta Talk. If you don't mind, I would love if you could leave a rating and review. Those help this show to get out to people who might find it useful or entertaining. I'm so grateful for your support. Please follow on Instagram at Sunny Abada or check out our latest blog post at wegotatalk.com slash blog. See you next time.